Some people are Afro-pessimists. They see Africa as the heart of darkness, forever doomed by poverty and corruption. Others are Afro-optimists. They see Africa rising inexorably, all sunshine and rainbows. Dr. Rutendo Huindingui is an Afro-realist who enables multinationals to see both the challenges and the 1.2 billion opportunities that each of the continent's people represents. He's going to show us how to find the pot at the end of the African rainbow. It's 1974. There are over 60,000 people in the stadium, over 100 countries watching worldwide in what is going to be the most cataclysmic boxing showdown in history. In one corner, you have the undefeated heavyweight champion in 1974, George Foreman. And in the other corner, you have the former world heavyweight champion, Muhammad Ali. The question we want to answer this morning is, how is it in eight rounds the world number one champion lost to Muhammad Ali, the underdog? And secondly, how can we apply that to your multinational strategy into Africa? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to take these off because you can imagine if I have to go to the gents, the complications that will arise when I go there. <laughs> George Foreman was the number one world boxing champion in 1974. He was big, he was arrogant, he was young, and he knew it. He represents the multinational coming into the African continent that is well-resourced. It's applied its strategies in Australia, in America, in in Asia and has been successful. Coming into Africa is going to be a walk in the park. Muhammad Ali was the former world heavyweight champion and he was trying to claw back his way into the history books. He was also arrogant, but not as strong and as powerful as George Foreman. He represents the underdog. He is the man who coined the term, float like a butterfly, sting like a... It shows your age. <laughs> the venue of this spectacular fight was in a place called Kinshasa, in a country called Zaire, presently called the DRC. It was a place both fighters had never been before. The atmosphere was different. The crowd was different. The dynamics was different. And that highlights Africa. It's a place of opportunity, but again, the terrain is totally different. To spice up the fight, this man, a dictator at the time, Mobutu Sese Seko, put in 10 million US dollars to sponsor the fight in 1974. As much as Africa provides opportunity, unpredictability is also there. Highlighting again that you as a multinational coming to the African terrain have to be aware. I believe there were two things that made Muhammad Ali successful on that day. The first thing that made him successful on that day was rope-a-dope. Rope-a-dope was a technique in which by you allowed the person who was punching you to actually punch you and you used the ropes to absorb the punches. Muhammad Ali knew that pound for pound, weight for weight, George Foreman was stronger than him. He knew that if he allowed George Foreman to come with his strength and sheer brutality, he wouldn't survive. So he became innovative. He changed his strategy. He adapted to the terrain. And after eight rounds, George Foreman kept coming with him, not changing his strategy, and Muhammad Ali allowed the ropes to absorb those punches. And after eight rounds, George Foreman was tired, and with a few final punches, Muhammad Ali took him out. The second thing that made Muhammad Ali successful on that day was a cry or a chant that is called Ali Bumaye. Ali Bumaye, which when you translate it, means Ali, kill him. Muhammad Ali flew in a few days earlier than George Foreman. And what he did was he trained and jogged and warned the hearts of the people of Kinshasa. He understood their mindset. He got into their DNA and the people loved him. On the day of the fight, as he strode onto the boxing room with the people screaming and shouting, they were shouting out, Ali Bumaye! Ali Bumaye! 
In other words, the underdog had become the winner even before the fight began. If you want to win the African market, understand the intimate intricacies that drives the African people, the culture, the dynamics. Ladies and gentlemen, Africa is open for business. In fact, it never was closed. The question is, is your multinational strategy for Africa ready for it? Thank you. The tender, welcome to Gurus. Thank you very much. There's kind of a schizophrenia about Africa, isn't there? I mean, we had those you know, front page articles in The Economist, Africa rising, and Africa's not rising so much, then maybe Africa's falling. I mean, where's Africa now? Justin, you bring a very important point. I think there's a lot of research and a lot of analysis that has been done on Africa. And I'm actually one of the people to say this, because when I did my PhD, I did it primarily looking at the opportunities of Africa with the diversity that is there. But I don't say I did a PhD to highlight how educated I am. If anything, a PhD qualifies you to tell you how uneducated you are based on the topics that you're doing. But in terms of Africa, if you look at the stats and the information that's there, there are a billion people in terms of the, the continent. There are 54 countries, which is a cauldron of diversity, of opportunity, of confusion, of mayhem, but at the same time, a, ch a vision that allows people to grow and mm -hmm. capitalize that. If you look at some of the statistics from a technological perspective, you realize that in Africa, in West Africa alone, the number of people with cell phones is more than in Europe and North America to a certain extent. Wow. So again, it just highlights the opportunity that is there. By the end of the day, that opportunity emanates from the people themselves harnessing that and driving that with the rest of the world. I've worked in Zimbabwe where there's been triple-digit inflation to bring double-digit growth. I've worked in West Africa. Mm. I've worked in East Africa. I've worked in Lusophone countries in Angola. And at the end of the day, you see success. There is poverty, mm. and I'm not shying away from the fact that there has to be a responsible solution to that. But at the end of the day, you realize that there are people there with a vision and a passion that want to succeed. Mm. And when you dovetail into that strategy and understand that terrain, then you capitalize in terms of bringing up what there is in Africa. Well, you know, I've had the privilege to do a lot of work in Zimbabwe. And when people, you tell that to people, they're like, Really? Like there's, you, there's actually yeah. work to be done in Zimbabwe. Yes, and there is. And, and, and what, what struck me was the potential of the people. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel when I was in Zimbabwe that people were at any different level, the professional people that I worked with, than in South Africa or, quite frankly, Europe or the United States. I found people were passionate, they were skilled, yeah. they had great ideas. Unfortunately, there's a system there that is not really conducive to unleashing that potential, but having said that, you're talking about that, that, that the inflation, there were people who became millionaires during that time because they found opportunities yeah. even in those incredibly trying times. You're, you're spot on, J Justin, and I think, you know, having worked in Zimbabwe, and I said I've traveled in a lot of the African countries, there was a time when I used to travel and I used to take pictures. I would go to Nigeria, I would go to Angola, I would go to Cameroon, and I would take pictures and bring them home to show my wife and kids, and I've been to this one, I've been to that place. And the infrastructure is not great. And I remember there was one time I was going through the pictures and I couldn't actually locate which country was which picture because they all looked the same. And then I realized, oh gosh, as much as Zimbabwe is unique, as much as Nigeria is unique, as much as Kenya mm -hmm. is unique, at the yeah. end of the day, there's a thread of uniqueness that goes through it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's sad, but sometimes it highlights again that underlying all of this, we are one people, one, one big continent mm. with different elements. And it's harnessing into that and harnessing into the uniqueness, but at the same time, what brings us the same, that's where you find success in the African market. One of the things that I find most encouraging about Africa is the entrepreneurial ethos. Yes. And you see it you know, on, a, on, on, on the streets. Yeah. You see it with people who are out there who, I guess, have been forced to go out there and make a living on their own. They, there, was, they, yeah. there weren't always the corporates to go and work for. And, and so we're seeing, I mean, just a few years ago, I was involved with IBM Smart Camp, one of the biggest entrepreneurship competitions in the world. Uh, is a little company called Mode from Kenya that landed up winning that competition above far more established, yeah. established startups from the United States and yeah. Europe. And they had something absolutely unique and brilliant. And that, in fact, is more and more the case. Yeah. So is there an opportunity to leverage the entrepreneurship within the continent? Is it about, how do we do that? It's education. Um, but when I say education, it's not education in the sense of alone, sit in a room and read a book and understand all the theory. That is still important. But it's education in terms of awareness. You'll be shocked that the more people become 
impoverished, the more people become realized in terms of what they lack, the more they want to understand in terms of what is out there and the ambition that is out there. From an African perspective, as, as much as there's poverty and there's challenges, people always look out and thanks to internet these days, they can Google and say, what is an ideal life? And that in itself is an mm. education. And that education then re makes you realize, but if that's what's in the world, mm. how can I make that in the world happen here? Mm. And already that's stirring up entrepreneurship. Mm. Then the next stage is how can I overcome the circumstances that surround me to fulfill a need that I feel in this? And you bring that, it creates a recipe of ingredients that ultimately can cook something yeah. that is spectacular. There is tremendous aspiration on this content and ambition. Yeah. And it feels like it's ripe yeah. for... Uh, I guess we shouldn't say revolution. We've had too many of those in Africa, <laughs> but certainly that's right for innovation. When we look at these challenges, yeah. you know, that are that that are ahead, and you're saying, well, in fact, the challenges are what are going to prompt people yeah. to come up with better ideas. Hundred percent. No, that's true. And I'll give you an example. There was a company I was working with. I was, it was a time I was with Sage and we were doing um, software solutions for different companies. And I remember one company coming and we were doing a major investment in the medical field in Africa. And they were using technology out of the most extreme parts of the world. And what fascinated me, I said, how, how with all this technology, you're still going to need doctors to work with the technology. And it says with the technology that we have these days, doctors don't actually have to come mm. into the African market through internet, through connectivity, through broadband. They can actually log on and work with patients through that advanced technology. And then I realized that here was a company that realized there was a problem in Africa, which was health. But at the same time, there was an opportunity right. to meet that need. And then they, they leveraged off technology or innovation in order to satisfy that. And that highlights, the, in terms of how you deal with Africa, look at the problem and turn on its head and say, how can we convert this problem into a solution that benefits all? So, Rutina, do you buy into this idea that in Africa we can leapfrog over technologies, as we did with cell phones? Landlines could take two, three, four years to get a landline, and you could get it instantly. In Rwanda right now, they're using drones well, for deliveries. Do you think that we might get to a point where actually Rwanda doesn't have to put in that road infrastructure because we're now using drones? 100%. And that's actually what is happening because the reality is if, if you go to some of the countries in Africa, you look at the infrastructure, you can see the construction, you can see the money going, but the pace that it's happening at, there is no way that those developments are going to catch up in time for everybody to benefit. Mm. So you'll start seeing technology, which is going to be key, but I don't want to limit it to technology because innovation is not technology. Mm. Innovation is saying, how can we do this same thing in a different way mm. based on the resources that are there? You have been successful in another environment that's not necessarily using the same techniques and approach in this environment mm. will guarantee that. So adaptation is key. And once you bring all those components together and then starting to apply that and having the gut and the zeal to succeed, then everything kicks in. And then you can have a rumble in the jungle and have a whole lot of fun. Indeed. Uh, indeed. <laughs> Dr. Attenda, thank you so much for joining us on Gurus. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.